Thanks for joining us today. Uh, and welcome to the Summer of Protocols guest talk series. Uh, this is going to be a series as part of a, an 18 week program where 12 core and 22 affiliate researchers are researching various aspects of protocols. If you'd like to find out more, you can go to summerofprotocols.com. Uh, today, we are talking with Jeff Manaw. Our next session is on Friday, and that's on the pilot study that started uh, this program. Uh, the pre-read link is in this document here, the program calendar, which you can find at that URL I mentioned earlier. Uh, so without further ado, I will hand it off to Venkat, who will introduce our speaker today. All right. Uh, Jeff, you here? I think that's uh, oh, there he is. I am. Yeah. Hello, hey, Jeff. Hey, everybody. All right. Uh, so, like many people, I first uh, ran across Jeff uh, through his blog, uh, building blog, B L D G B L O G, I believe, and an article called um, Nakatomi Spaces, which is named after uh, the building in uh, Die Hard, and it was totally fascinating and completely altered how I think about urban environments. And Jeff went on to write an awesome book <laughs> uh, uh, the uh, Buzzler's uh, Guide to the City. And it's about how, I think of it as like almost the opposite of Seeing Like a State by James Scott, where Seeing Like a State is a book about how uh, authoritarians view uh, city as like a central planning domain and burglars view it as like a surface of like exploits and gaps and things to sneak through and uh, um, basically, I don't know, yeah, steal things from. So that's uh, Jeff's angle on the city. So what we're gonna do is have like a little salon style um, uh, session here where Jeff is gonna take about 10, 15 minutes to share a few stories from the book uh, with particular relevance to like the city as a protocol. Uh, then we'll have like uh, um, a brief uh, conversation he and I where we'll talk about a few of the basic questions then we'll open it up to you guys to talk uh, and discuss um, the themes. Uh, we're raising here today. And I know several of you are working on like specifically city and urban environments as your pr protocol team here. So that should be some interesting connections. All right, so Jeff, uh, over to you. Are you sharing slides or just speaking either way is fine? Um, yeah, I do have some slides. So um, hopefully I can do this right, but I'll just share my screen uh, from PowerPoint and just go, go through some things that are, that it's really kind of more like eye candy just to sort of have something to look at in the background. Um, but why don't I go ahead and do that? And then, uh, yeah, then we'll throw things off to the to the Q&A. But um, so while I'm trying to figure out to make sure that I'm doing this right. Uh, okay, and then. All right, so do you all see that this? It's full screen for you or? Yep, right. looks good to us. All right, cool. So, yep. um, yes. So as, as Venkat mentioned, um, yeah, I'm the author of a book called A Burglar's Guide to the City. And um, the examples I'll be talking about today are taken from that. Um, I'm probably not the best person in the world to um, uh, kick off discussions of, uh, you know, blockchain protocols and that kind of thing. Um, so hopefully you'll see the reason why um, the following themes I think will be relevant to what you're doing in the, in the summer of protocols. Um, as Venkat mentioned, a lot of the uh, criminal activity that gets lumped into burglary, uh, which is a uh, very precisely defined crime involving property lines and involving a, a very clear uh, demarcation between an interior and an exterior. Um, a lot of this comes down to rules, regulations, and protocols. And um, I'm going to show a couple examples today, um, well, the first of which will be taken from the city where I live, uh, which is Los Angeles. And um, I'll show a couple other examples from uh, how architecture can be taken advantage of and how the rules of space and the rules of infrastructure and the rules of a city um, can be used uh, effectively against that city or against that building um, in the name of burglary. Um, so yeah, I'll start off here uh, with Los Angeles. Uh, so this is just a map of LA. Um, north is to the right of this image. Uh, so those are the Hollywood Hills. Um, and I'll explain while we're looking at this in a second. Um, but so in the late 80s and early 1990s, Los Angeles was the bank robbery capital of the world, quote unquote. Um, that's according to the FBI special agent, a guy named William J. Rader, who was the head of the FBI's uh, bank crime task force uh, during that phase of uh, the city's history. 
Um, I actually had the uh, the pleasure of meeting um, Agent Raider uh, for lunch at the Santa Monica Airport uh, to uh, discuss his his uh, history with investigating bank crime in in the city of LA while I was researching a burglar's guide. Um, William Rader was actually, uh, you know, one of his claims to fame, uh, this, uh, aside from also having uh, co-written a, a really great memoir about his time as an FBI agent here in the city, um, is that he was the guy who actually had uh, Keanu Reeves assigned to him during the filming of uh, 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 Pit, uh, Point Break, uh, the, the bank crime film. And uh, apparently, uh, you know, Keanu Reeves got to follow along with uh, Agent Rader uh, on, on certain bank crime uh, investigation and responses uh, and apparently learned nothing according to Agent Raider. Um, but in any case, uh, rather than talk about Point Break, um, I, I wanted to talk about a couple of things. So what is it about Los Angeles that allowed this city to become the, the bank robbery capital of the world? Um, there are many, many factors that go into this. Uh, there's a, there was a remarkable lack of uh, private security at banks during that time. Um, there was even a lack of what we now call bandit barriers, uh, which are the bulletproof uh, plexiglass uh, walls that separate tellers from uh, the people, the clientele that come into the bank. Um, but there were also some really interesting, more um, uh, sort of macro scalar issues that led to the bank crime surge, um, and those were infrastructural. Um, so I'm going to talk about two of those. Um, one I'll just mention briefly. Um, there's actually a, a category of, of business which is referred to as a stop and rob. So a stop and rob is more or less exactly what it sounds like. Um, you would simply stop and rob something and get back on the freeway. But, but the reason why it was possible is because the LA freeway system, when it was first designed, um, you know, you would have an off ramp. You'd have some sort of commercial plaza, and then there'd be a nearby on-ramp. Well, every once in a while, that system uh, uh, produced the effect that at the bottom of an off-ramp, there would be a bank or a credit union, and right across the street, there would be an on-ramp onto the freeway again. Um, so there were only, you know, uh, there, there weren't hundreds of examples of that, but there were dozens. Um, but so those financial institutions were uniquely vulnerable to burglary because someone could simply pull off the, fry, the freeway, rob the bank and get back on the freeway and be on the other side of Los Angeles County um, before police even had arrived at the, at the bank to begin an investigation or, or a response. And so the stop and rob, uh, it becomes a kind of um, infrastructural vulnerability in the city itself and also something that, you know, obviously was not thought of uh, when traffic uh, transportation designers were coming up with the LA freeway system at the time. Um, so it's quite interesting to imagine that even something as uh, physically monumental as a city's transportation infrastructure might be putting into place crimes that will take that will occur, uh, you know, 20, even 30 years in the future. Um, and that it would do we would we would do well to think about these things when we're designing our cities, you know, how will they be misused and what are the um, unique uh, vulnerabilities that they that they open up. Um, but another one that it shows why Los Angeles uh, was prone to bank crimes. Uh, uh, and this one is a bit more extraordinary and way more Hollywood, um, but is why we're looking at this map. Um, so this is actually a map of the of the city's stormwater network. Um, so the stormwater network funnels, uh, you know, generally speaking, winter rainfall um, down through a series of concrete pipes and culverts underneath the surface of the city. Uh, they join up with uh, other sewer networks and stormwater distribution networks and take it all out to the, to the sea. Um, and so this is a this is a drainage basin that that uh, exists in the Hollywood Hills. Um, and so one of the biggest uh, bank crimes in in LA history, and what could have been one of the biggest bank crimes in world history, um, occurred in 1986 uh, when a group of people who became known as the Hole in the Ground Gang, um, and again this was a group that was investigated by Agent Raider, the individual I mentioned earlier. Um, they actually used uh, four by four vehicles uh, and the city stormwater network by going in through this dra drainage basin, which is up in the Hollywood Hills, um, passing under the surface of the, of the neighborhood, um, down into Hollywood, where at the corner of Sunset and Spalding, um, they began digging a tunnel up into a bank vault. And so um, they did a couple of things that are quite interesting with this. Um, one was that they used the bank's own electrical network to power their power their tools. And so the bank was going through electrical uh, disturbances, you know, the Muzak would turn on and off, uh, uh, alarms would constantly be triggered. Um, there was, uh, every once in a while, they would feel minor shaking, but for the most part, they they joked that there was a poltergeist in the bank because the electrical system was acting so strange. Um, but it was actually bank robbers underneath the, underneath the, you know, drilling upward into the bank vault. Um, of course, they triggered the alarm so many times that when they actually did break in, uh, you know, it's like the classic boy who cried wolf, um, the police didn't believe that it was actually a bank robbery. Uh, and so uh, gave them much more time to to uh, continue trying to rob the vault that they'd broken into. Um, but what interests me is is less uh, that particular mode of entry, um, but the 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 fact that the the city's infrastructure itself uh, sort of allowed for this crime. 
Um, so this is just zooming in on the map that we saw earlier. Um, and now on this version, you can see in the sort of your rights here, um, that's the drainage basin where they where they dropped in. Um, they went in through a culvert that you can actually follow along in Google Maps of all things, um, or you know, Google Street View is what I mean. So you can actually trace the route of the bank robbers before they disappeared into a tunnel area. And then the red square is the approximate location of the bank in um, 1986. And so a couple of things that are just worth pointing out is that the FBI, first of all, this is still an unsolved crime, um, and it's also past the uh, statute of limitations. So um, as Agent, Agent Rader pointed out, uh, they could you know, show up at City Hall tomorrow and uh, announce exactly how they did it and what they did with the proceeds, and they, and they can't be arrested anymore. Um, but there were theories of uh, who exactly it was that did this. Um, and so the two of the leading theories, I think, are quite interesting. Um, one is that they were so good at tunneling uh, because they had this whole sort of tunneling apparatus where they came from the stormwater network through their own tunnel and then up into the bank vault. Um, and even their concrete coring when they got into the bank vault um, was so precise uh, that one of the theories was that these were mining professionals. Um, so they were disgruntled miners who had come into Los Angeles to basically mine their way through the city's bank vault and uh, get away with uh, as much money as they could and you know, put their tactical knowledge of the earth and of geology and of drilling and of mining uh, to work for financial crime. Um, there was another version of that theory though, which was that they knew the stormwater network so well um, and they knew the precise dimensions of the tunnels uh, to the point where they understood that their four by four vehicles would fit. Um, they knew exactly where the tunnels went. They had sort of uh, a, a series of uh, camps and places to set up where they, where they were doing the, the mining and the drilling. Um, so another theory was that they were actually disgruntled water and power employees. Um, they knew the city so well that they knew how to rob it. And I think that that's something that we'll we'll talk about continuously um, over the next hour. Um, and so, you know, in, in the grain of the city are is the knowledge of how that city works. And if you know it down to the point of um, it's where it's 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 highway or freeway off off ramps and on ramps are, um, if you know where the stormwater networks go, if you know what the earth itself is made out of geologically, you can drill through it. Um, so a sufficiently advanced knowledge of the city lends itself to crime. Um, these are actual, these are the actual FBI uh, crime photos that that Agent Rader showed me. Um, so you, you get a sense of what the tunnels look like. Um, this was the investigation into how they got to where they were. Um, they even did interesting things where they built um, dams uh, to hold back stormwater. Uh, while they were doing the drilling. And then when the debris uh, uh, piled up, all the dirt, all of the gravel, all of uh, even their own trash and that kind of th stuff, um, when they, they would then uh, stick it into the middle of the tunnel and then knock their own dam down. And then the stormwater that had been building up over the day or over two days would wash through and wash all of the evidence down further into the sewer network. Um, so it's a pretty ingenious crime. Um, there's way more. This is the actual tunnel or the hole itself uh, into the bank vault looking down. Um, there's much more to be said about this particular crime, but um, and maybe we can get to it in the Q and A. Um, but for now, it's just this this uh, this idea uh, summed up here, which is um, sufficiently granular knowledge of a city will include ways to rob that city. So that's the first bit I wanted to talk about. Um, the second one um, is a different type of crime. Uh, it's still burglary, but it's a different way of targeting uh, and choosing targets. Um, this is actually an example from Toronto. Um, and these maps are uh, fire insurance maps, uh, and they're and they're here just for eye candy, just to have something on in the background in case you're wondering uh, what the what these are uh, here for. Um, but while I was writing a burglar's guide to the city, uh, an individual got in touch with me under a pseudonym and said that he was a retired burglar uh, who he now works in the private security industry uh, in uh, Ontario, and he had a whole bunch of really interesting stories to tell me about how it is that he got into places. Um, you know, he had the sorts of uh, insights about even using um, websites like Emporis that have uh, a really detailed construction information about buildings um, down to the point of uh, explaining what the walls are made out of so he would know which tools to take. Um, he talked about uh, even using real estate websites like Zillow and Redfin um, you know, to get photographs of the inside of places that he might target uh, and pointing out, of course, that the internet is kind of a godsend for burglars because it allows uh, um, inside views. It allows us to get floor plans. Um, you'll find this, in fact, actually, or rather, I'll, I have found this, um, you know, if you meet somebody um, uh, and they give you their address and say they're having a cocktail party or they're having friends around for dinner, um, if you Google their address to try to find out how to get there for a route on Google Maps, um, one generally speaking now, the first five uh, 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 Google search uh, responses um, are going to be to real estate uh, sites. So you'll know how much they paid for their house. You'll know what their floor plan is. 
um, you'll have seen photographs of the interior of the of the location if you click on these. Um, so that kind of information is hiding in plain sight. Um, but there was another thing that was not hiding in plain sight and that really struck me as a particularly ingenious way of understanding the city and understanding architecture. Um, and so this individual had figured out that the fire code uh, in Toronto uh, was so specific that if you studied fire code, you could actually get a really, really uh, detailed and highly accurate understanding, a kind of foreshadowing of what you were getting into as a burglar. Um, because you could look at buildings from the outside, um, you could see where the emergency fire exits were, um, you could see maybe how many windows there were per floor, um, you could start deducing how many apartments that would mean are in a certain building and on a certain floor. Um, you would know where the emergency exit routes were on that floor based on how the, the, the stairs came out onto the, an alleyway or onto the street itself. Um, and then also there are uh, maximum mandated distances between an apartment door and the nearest fire exit. So you can begin to get a sense of how long it will take for you to get from, say, the door of an apartment you've robbed to the emergency stairs so that you can you can flee if you need to. Um, he also pointed out that uh, some uh, not every floor is alarmed. And so, in fact, it actually tends to operate in a pattern. Um, let's just hypothetically say it's every four floors would be unalarmed. Um, so in other words, then you'd want to find a floor that isn't alarmed, and that would be the floor that you would rob. Um, and if you are aware of how far the apartments are from the emergency exits, you, you're, you can begin to get a sense here that um, you, can, you can predict in advance how long it might take for you to get up there, get into an apartment, not, not trigger an alarm, and then, and then leave the building. Um, and so what I think is pretty fascinating about this is that the um, you know, fire code is there pr to protect us. It's there to protect firefighters. It's there to sculpt architecture through regulation, um, but it's meant to be in the name of public safety. Um, there's something really devious and, and um, compelling, I think, in this idea that um, that code, that regulation, those protocols that have been instituted by the city are the very things that would lead burglars to our door. Um, there's something about that that um, is, is worth discussing today as well, um, and that I would just sum up here as the rules meant to protect something also show how it can be attacked. And so hopefully you'll see from that example and from the hole in the ground gang and the idea of the stop and rob, um, that uh, when you begin to see how a system works and how a system is designed, um, how, it, uh, how it operates spatially, how certain events occur in space temporally, uh, you know, when people will be home, when they won't be home, uh, when a bank will be protected, or when when people will be uh, will notice you drilling into the vault. Um, you can begin to uh, overlay a crime onto that, and that a crime simply becomes, uh, specifically an act of burglary in this case, um, just becomes a way of of misusing that information or of reorienting it in the, in the, in the direction of criminality. Um, and then the final example I wanted to give, uh, just before going into a more general discussion, um, was an individual who uh, at this point is now kind of an internet urban legend. So you, you may even have heard this story, uh, whether or not you've read uh, Burger's Guide to the City. Um, but it was a pretty legendary individual. Um, his name was Jeffrey Manchester. Uh, he was he became known as Roof Man. And um, uh, I guess you can't see that, or maybe you can, but um, there's a McDonald's uh, logo on this. Uh, so what this is, is a is the floor plan of a McDonald's restaurant. Um, so, so Roof Man was a really interesting criminal. Um, his deal was that he noticed that in the repetitive floor plans of fast food chains, and gradually speaking, he kept uh, kind of expanding his uh, repertoire of different uh, franchises that he would break into. Um, but at first it was McDonald's. Um, you have two things that he noticed. One is that you have very repetitive floor plans. So once you know how to rob one McDonald's, in a sense, you know how to rob every McDonald's. But he also noticed that McDonald's being a corporately owned, uh, you know, super, super corporate, super franchise, um, had very specific uh, uh, instructions for employees at very specific times of day to do things like opening up the registers or closing the registers or taking money out and putting it into the safe at certain times of day uh, for uh, pickup later or maybe even for, um, uh, you know, getting fresh uh, cash from the bank. And so he began to piece together this uh, knowledge and realized that if you broke into a McDonald's at a specific time of day, um, you would not only be in the right place because you 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 spatially chose the right place to to cut down through the roof, um, but you might you would also interrupt employees doing the exact same thing at the same time. Um, so in the book, I kind of compare it to a criminal Groundhog Day, um, referring to the Bill Murray movie, where you know Roofman just basically committed the same crime over and over again. His life became this kind of repetitive super loop of breaking into McDonald's, uh, breaking into the same space of McDonald's uh, at the exact time same time of day. And he got so good at it that he eventually expanded on to different franchises. 
um, and he started hitting other fast food restaurants. Um, uh, he started hitting big box stores, and uh, he saw in corporate repetition um, a vulnerability that hadn't been taken into consideration by the people that designed these stores, uh, or these restaurants rather, uh, and he put it to use for his criminal purposes. Um, he was also, a, I guess, a sort of notoriously nice, quote unquote. Uh, so even though he's breaking into uh, McDonald's and scaring people, uh, you know, he didn't hurt anyone. Uh, he would herd uh, often uh, employees into the refrigerator while he did his work. Uh, but even like uh, he was, he was uh, known at a couple of occasions to insist that they all go get their winter jackets and put them on before going into the refrigerator. Um, you know, he was the the gentleman burglar, I suppose you could say. Um, but uh, his story got even weirder. Uh, so after he went to jail uh, and he and he uh, escaped uh, from prison, um, he decided that he found a, like a whole new level of repetition uh, and a whole new kind of realm of, of corporate space time uh, to inhabit. Um, and so he graduated from breaking into McDonald's at the same time of day at the same spot. And he decided instead to, he broke into a Toys R Us and he, uh, uh, built a uh, fake uh, apartment uh, behind the walls so that he, uh, almost like that movie Inside Man, if you've seen it, uh, the Spike Lee movie, um, where he had an apartment hidden, uh, you know, uh, inside a, a different part of the, of the, of the building. Um, and he actually stole um, things like baby monitors, um, the cameras that you'd use to watch a crib or watch your children play or for home security. Um, and he used those to spy on the Toys R Us uh, so that he would get a sense of when the employees were there uh, when he could come out, um, you know, how he may, how he might get food, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so he set up his own sort of private surveillance network using children's toys. Um, he had his own little secret apartment uh, that was also lined uh, with, um, I spoke to the woman that arrested him. I was a police officer in North Carolina. And, um, you know, she pointed out that when she, when they went into his little lair, uh, it was uh, filled with all the Spider-Man uh, uh, gear. So there were Spider-Man posters everywhere. Uh, he had Spider-Man best bed sheets, according to her. Um, you know, there were DVDs, he had his own television, uh, he had just uh, pilfered all this stuff from the store. Um, so my point here is simply that um, in addition to this just being a very fascinating uh, and, and, and bizarre example of criminal behavior, um, that even then, um, you know, it, it comes down to this idea of noticing in uh, the repetitive patterns of employees. Oh, and that's another thing, he actually um, uh, had access to, because he was inside the store, he had access to the, the employee calendar um, and so he would change the calendar uh, assignments of different employees at different times to try to engineer moments where he would have more freedom um, or there might not be certain or particular employees in the store at a certain time. Um, and so you can imagine how strange that would be to find out later that, you know, that weird shift um, that you were given on a Sunday, you know, 15 years ago at a, at a, at a Toys R Us uh, was actually given to you by a criminal who was living inside the walls. Um, you know, those are the sorts of things that uh, it would take a particularly advanced state of paranoia to even think that kind of thing. And yet, nevertheless, that was a, that was what actually happened in a Roofman saga inside the inside the Toys R Us. Um, and so I'm going to summarize that then as that repetitive systems suggest identical crimes. Um, you know, we saw it in the stop and rob. Um, you know, if you can find a, a Bank of America that's at the bottom of an off ramp and at the bottom of an on ramp. Um, and then you find a Wells Fargo, and then you find a, uh, you know, J.P. Morgan Chase or whatever it might be, um, you know, that is in the same spot, you're eventually, or in the same type of uh, circumstance, um, you are in effect committing the exact same bank robbery over and over again. It's a repetitive system, it's in the shape of a city, and you have found an identical, uh, an identical crime. Uh, to a certain extent, that's also true of the, um, the fire code example. You know, uh, once you understand fire code as, a, as the kind of matrix that generates the architecture around you, um, you begin to see that certain apartment buildings are, you know, de facto identical. Um, they might look different and they might have been constructed 30 or 40 years apart. Um, but there is a fundamental kind of spatial DNA there that you can use as a burglar to plan what to break into. Um, and then, of course, this example from um, Roofman and his uh, sort of uh, space time piracy, uh, which is my how I would repeat or excuse me, how I would rephrase this uh, as uh, space time itself as a burglary tool. Um, Venkat, you you sent me an uh, interesting example of a uh, of a uh, a game uh, Eve Online uh, that also had a kind of a big heist that didn't didn't necessarily involve space time, but I think that um, you know the idea that uh, hidden in the actual structure of the the world as we know it are the capabilities or the possibilities of 
of super crimes, of very large heists, of uh, things that we might not have considered uh, even stealable, um, I think would be something that would be worth talking about. And how this kind of insight can be scaled up to not just infrastructure, uh, but to whole planetary systems. Um, you know, what might it be? What might be the future of uh, burglary or of heists uh, in, a, in an increasingly internet world run by protocols and run by pieces of infrastructure um, that connect uh, even intercontinentally? Um, you know, what what are the crimes being set up by that, and who are the people that will 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 see the possibilities of those crimes, and who will um, uh, be able to implement them. You know, recall again, um, uh, Agent Raider from Los Angeles uh, hypothesizing that the people that robbed the banks there uh, were either disgruntled miners or disgruntled water and power employees. Um, you know, again, what is that role in the future and who will be the people that understand our systems so well um, that they can rob, in effect, everything? Um, that's something that I think would be also be worth discussing both today um, and over the course of the, the Summer of Protocols. Um, and then I'm going to put up an image of um, uh, Nakatomi Plaza, aka uh, the the uh, Fox Building here in Los Angeles. Um, I, if you all read that uh, blog post, uh, which was somewhat embarrassingly long ago now, I believe it was published in 2010. Um, but you know that looks at Die Hard as a kind of spatial premise, and um, I had a kind of bucket list uh, experience where I actually got to fly around the Die Hard building in a helicopter. Um, and so this is my own photograph. Um, I, I made the helicopter pilot actually deviate so that we could fly around this thing. I think he thought I was nuts, uh, but it was really, really exciting for me. Um, and so I think I'll leave this image up, uh, or at the very least, I'll, uh, I guess maybe I won't leave it up. I'll have it up as a, as a uh, so you can just look, look at it now, and then I'll de-share my screen. And then Venkat, you and I can maybe do the Q&A, and we can respond to some questions from the audience as well, um, including talking about why uh, Nakatomi Plaza is up on the screen in the first place. Um, but um, yeah, hopefully that was a, a, a good introduction to why burglary um, uh, uh, is, is, a, is a topic uh, that uh, lends itself to protocol level thinking. And um, uh, yeah, let's uh, let's jump into a discussion uh, from here. All right. Yeah, that was um, awesome and um, a good refresher on kind of like the highlight insights from the book. And um, I have like a whole bunch of questions and I could easily hog the whole hour. So I'll limit myself to a couple and I'll let the others have a turn. Um, but the first um, question that occurred to me as you were speaking is, there's something peculiarly modern about uh, the kinds of crimes you're talking about. They're like um, a sort of urban and modernity phenomenon. Do you, while researching the book, did you come across like uh, a sense of the history and how we went from, I guess, whatever pre-modern crimes were through highway robberies to modernity? Like, what's the transition like? Um, yeah, that's that's an interesting question. Um, I did get into some of the, I guess you could say, sort of the prehistory of burglary in the book. Um, at one point, I spoke to a historian of, uh, of ancient Rome uh, and tried to get an understanding of the origin. Uh, you know, first of all, you know, were there what was the what was the kind of like the ocean's eleven of the ancient world? Like you know, were there were there heists back then? Uh, you know, were people breaking into temples? Were people breaking into family homes? Um, and 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 what was the origin of policing in in a, in a world like that? Um, and he had some pretty interesting things to talk about as well. So um, you know, one of which was that uh, even all the way back in uh, the ruins of Pompeii, uh, there is uh, evidence of um, of fortified rooms inside some of these mansions that would have been used. Um, you know, Pompeii, of course, was a was a basically a kind of a suburb of Rome, so to speak, uh, or or, uh, or or at the very least, like uh, of Naples. And um, when the uh, volcano uh, uh, erupted and buried the city in in uh, volcanic ash, uh, it you know it left an extremely well preserved uh, 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 sequence of of, of ar a, a, a well preserved architecture underneath the ash. Um, and within that, um, you know, you can see what people had, how the cities were, how the town, the uh, buildings were designed. Um, and whatnot. So there were vaults. Uh, the idea was that there, even back then there were things that needed to be protected um, and that would have potentially been broken into. Um, but he also made a really interesting point, which was that um, large scale events uh, in Rome, such as the uh, 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 the Circus Maximus, where you would have things like uh, chariot races or even for that matter on, on days that there were gladiator uh, uh, fights. Um, that that those were known days for criminal activity. So people would uh, there would be so many people that would be down at the stadium or the, who would be down watching the sporting event that all of these homes and all of these neighborhoods would be left effectively empty. Um, and so a lot of the times those were the days that homes would get broken into. 
um, and burglars sort of became uh, part of the city in that sense. So again, that's a good example of how the rhythm of the city um, was, was bringing everyone to one location. And so the people that went against the grain of that rhythm and went back into the ghost neighborhoods or the empty neighborhoods, um, you know, would, would find, uh, you know, opportunities for crime. Um, and so, um, yeah, so you do actually find these, these kinds of examples, even in, in um, uh, you know, pre-modern uh, 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 ur urbanism. And a great example, actually, just briefly was, um, you know, that I, I wanted to mention when I was talking about Jeffrey Manchester, um, is the book, my book actually opens with an example from uh, re the real world, which was a, an individual named George Leonidas Leslie, um, who was actually trained as an architect. Uh, he was from Cincinnati, and he moved to New York City uh, just a couple years after the American Civil War ended um, in the in the eighteen uh, sixties. And at one point, he he was a an architect, uh, but he formed a bank robbery gang. And at one point, his gang was responsible for eighty percent of all the bank robberies on the on the East Coast of uh, America at the time, uh, because precisely because he was he was an incredibly uh, talented architectural thinker. Um, and a lot of the Hollywood cliches that we have of of um, things like Ocean's Eleven. Um, uh, you know, the villainous burglar, burglary crew come from this guy. Um, you know, he allegedly had a photographic memory, so he would pretend that he wanted to open a safe deposit box or he needed to put something in the vault, but he wanted to get it, he wanted to go see it first. Uh, and then he would memorize the dimensions. Um, uh, he was very good at convincing people because he was an architect and who doesn't trust an architect uh, to let him see floor plans. Uh, you know, he would say, uh, you know, uh, I, I hear you're a, you know, you're the manager of a bank and I'm, I'm working on a bank design up in Boston. Like, can I see your floor plans? I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm stuck on a detail. And then he would see exactly how the bank was designed on Fifth Avenue or whatnot. And then he would rob it. Um, but he also then took that architectural information and, and uh, had a series of warehouses in Brooklyn where he designed uh, decoy vaults. Uh, and so they would actually uh, design a, a, a version of the thing they were going to break into. And his crew would train on it so much um, that they could actually rob these places in the dark without knocking into furniture. Um, and so it's that kind of a, you know, thinking again that that's not, I mean, that is modern, but it's, um, you know, it's pre-digital, I guess you could say. Um, but it's another example of how um, paying attention to how the city is designed uh, can be used against that city in the name of crime. Yeah, it sounds like it's really the affordances of modernity, you can also find them at least in more limited form every, for everywhere from like ancient Rome onwards. And uh, um, I guess technology also plays a role, like at some point, like actual locks were invented as opposed to like, you know, just dead bolts or something. Uh, but speaking of like space, um, you know, history is like one dimension and you mentioned space time as kind of like the substrate for all this. Yeah, in space in Nakatomi spaces, you kind of like make a distinction between like the regular spaces ordinary people use, like the corridors and elevators, and then the uh, Nakatomi space is this sort of hidden coextensive space of like air ducts and vents and like crawl spaces. And um, there's, I guess, uh, uh, you also in some of your other writing uh, talk about the Israeli defense forces and how they have this um, a pattern of like busting through walls in a straight line. So it seems like there's like almost a spectrum of like overlapping spaces of like the legitimate, um, what I guess Deleuze would call um, striated spaces, then sort of partially striated spaces, and then busting through walls at the other extreme, kind of treating it like a wilderness, right? So is there like uh, sort of, um, I don't know, more structure to this um, uh, various spaces going on here? Well, yeah, it's almost as if there's a parallel world sort of behind ours, and it's made out of the maintenance corridors and fire fire emergency stairs and boiler rooms and other other places that quote unquote we um, you know don't generally speaking have access to. You know, we're not we're not supposed to be there. Um, uh, there's an example in the book that I talk about actually. Um, it's a guy named um, uh, I want to say I think his name is Bill Mason. Um, but he was a, a jewelry thief and, uh, and a cat burglar, and he would break into apartments, um, mostly in South Florida. Um, but his, his uh, method of approach uh, was similar, in a sense, to Roofman, in that he would just memorized the patterns of people and when, when they were home and then how to get into their apartment using other people's balconies. Um, but what was really interesting about him was that, you know, his, when, when he was asked later, because he wrote a memoir about being a, a jewel thief, um, he was asked, uh, you know, what was it about this that led him? And uh, his his response was that he loved architecture. It's such a strange answer, you know, but his uh, he said that he grew up um, sort of, uh, you know, he had parents, obviously, but um, they didn't they weren't around a lot. And uh, he was kind of raised by uh, building superintendents. 
Um, and so these are the kinds of people that will freely go up to the roof. They'll go down into the basement. They, they have keys to all the extra closets and all the maintenance corridors. And, um, you know, he grew up with a feeling of comfort in the spaces that he wasn't meant to go into. Um, and so, you know, I think it happens a lot, especially like when my wife and I are traveling and we're, we're, we're trying to find just a, you know, we're on the, if you're on the second or third floor, it seems like a waste of time to take the elevator. So why don't we just take the stairs down to the lobby? But like good in, in American architecture, it's like good luck finding the stairs. And even if you can find stairs, it always appears to be behind an, an alarm door. You know, are we really meant to open this door? Um, are we going to get locked in the stairwell? You know, it's all these, all these spatial uh, dilemmas of, and you're just trying to get from one floor to the next. Um, but so a comfort with what I call architectural dark matter, which is like the, which is these, these corridors behind everything else, um, the things that connect from the other side, um, the stairways that we're not meant to be on, um, you know, all of those things I think um, are, are part of the Nakatomi space idea. And so, um, yeah, the analysis that I, that I do in the Nakatomi space blog post, and that does touch on the Israeli defense forces is this idea that that's a totally separate mode of circulation that can be used. And in Die Hard, it's quite interesting that um, both the terrorists and especially John McClane, and in particular John McClane, um, you know, he 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 uses Nakatomi Tower, uh, Nakatomi Plaza in in all of the wrong ways, quote unquote. So you know, uh, he rides on top of elevators instead of in them. You know, he stops elevators between floors. Uh, you know, he shoots his way through doors and then drops down through ventilation shafts and then crawls through air ducts, et cetera, et cetera. You know, at one point he even jumps off the building and then comes back in from the outside. Um, but so Nakatomi space is this idea that architecture can be misused and in fact is some and in some senses um, is more interesting when when misused, when abused. Um, you can get to uh, places faster, of course, by blow, blowing your way through the walls. Um, the example from the Israeli Defense Forces is that you know that um, uh, if 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 the enemy expects you to be approaching the building from the street and is therefore looking out the window and trying to see you approaching, you know, up up the alleyway or or up up the 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 the, the road that you live on, um, then don't use the road for that. You know, travel from room to room by going wall to wall or even through uh, floors and ceiling. Um, and it's this idea of infesting a building instead of uh, just circulating through it. Um, or, uh, you know, popping up unexpectedly when someone someone thinks that a, a wall, you know, closes off circulation, to, but to a burglar, that's often the easiest way to get through from one room to the next. Um, and so, um, yeah, there's a, so much more, actually, that we could talk about there. I mean, even just the tools for doing this, you know, fire departments are quite interesting because um, a lot of the tools that fire, to, fire uh, respondents use is specifically used to cut through architecture and uh, to get from one room to the next or one building to the next. And it's a surgical approach to to buildings as opposed to just simply you know just dousing a building in water mm -hmm. um you know so it's quite interesting that a, actually a lot of the the tools a burglar could use to get from you know to to really do the perfect heist actually could would come from the local fire department um which i think would be an interesting uh, scenario for someone to explore um but so yeah it's this idea of just like you know not taking for granted you know architects want you to use hallways that's why they design them um, but what if the hallway is the last thing you're going to use to get from one room um, to the one next to it? Um, I think those kinds of questions are are both protocol based, but also it's about under it's about finding a different logic inside the architecture, um, and then um, enforcing that logic through tools. Well, I have a million more questions, but instead of hogging the airtime here, uh, let's open it up to more questions from everybody else in the room. So, uh, Josh, do you have a protocol in mind? Should people raise their hands, or how do you want to do this? Yeah, let's have people raise their hands. Dorian said his hand raised for for a while, so we can go ahead and start with him. If you don't know, the little hand raise thing is uh, over the reactions button there at the bottom. Yeah, it's a little hard to find. I always miss it. <laughs> Jeff, thank you so much for that. It's super interesting. Actually, your book has been on my list to pick up for a while. Um, Thanks. So we're gonna have to uh, expedite that now. Um, I was curious. First of all, I wanted to remark that uh, the your piece on Nakatomi space reminded me of the uh, police crashing through the ceiling in the movie Brazil. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, I, I wanted to ask you, um, to what extent do you have a criminology background or is this just like a complete thing that you kind of crashed into? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess, uh, you know, maybe some things I, I won't, I won't discuss, but uh, no, my, uh, my background is really just architecture. So um, I've always been interested in uh, yeah, the criminal misuse of of buildings. I've also been um, interested in, you know, I think growing up, I wasn't like Bill Mason, the man I mentioned earlier, but, you know, exploring abandoned buildings in the town I grew up in, 
um, you know, finding a way into my family's attic, getting up onto the roof, all of that stuff was always exciting to me. Um, and then I was always really drawn to heist movies as well. And um, I guess there was just a combination of all these things came together, um, which was the realization that heist movies are all about architecture. Um, you know, as a genre, it's one of the only genres that you can truly get away with having an entire scene where people are just discussing how to get from one room to the next. You know, that's not a very interesting dramatic scenario, but it is in a heist movie. Um, you know, uh, or even how to figure out, uh, you know, a connection between the sewer network and a building or that kind of thing. Um, and so while pushing on that idea that heist movies are fundamentally architectural, um, I started just paying more attention to news reports of burglaries and news reports of home invasions and that kind of thing. And it just became incredibly interesting to see how, um, you know, if a, if a, say, a pawn shop was robbed uh, the night before here in Los Angeles, the next morning, in, almost inevitably, you know, there would be people on the news uh, and they would be marveling at the at in surprise at how people got in. And so maybe it was somebody who slipped in through the uh, dry cleaners uh, laundry drop off window. Um, and there's even often like, a, you know, surveillance footage of, of half of a human body coming through a, a small door in the wall um, or they cut down through the roof or they came in through the bathroom wall because uh, the bathroom wall is, is, is exactly on the other side of a bathroom wall for a different building uh, or a different business rather. And if that business is abandoned, you know, you can break into an abandoned building that doesn't have an alarm. You can cut a hole through the drywall and next thing you know, you're inside a pawn shop, you know, and, um, and you, you have access to the safe. Um, but so, you know, listening to business owners, listening to police, and then of course, listening to bur burglars who had been either arrested or were reformed burglars. Um, it just seemed that like this was a totally different approach to architecture. And as an architectural writer, um, I just really wanted to focus on that and so take those kinds of stories and bring them to the fore and say, how do these people look at the built environment? Um, you know, what do they see where an architect might see, um, you know, uh, really uh, fine level uh, craftsmanship, or they might see uh, historical details that ma make it clear that this is a, a, you know, a 19th century building or that kind of thing. Um, a burglar might see really good handholds to get up to the second floor or the third floor. Um, you know, it's a kind of a tactical uh, way to look at architecture as opposed to an aesthetic way to, of looking at architecture. And almost all architectural writing now really is aesthetic. It's about, um, to a certain extent, it's socioeconomic, um, but it's very often not tactical. Um, and so that's what I wanted to, to, to pay attention to. So it's not that I have a criminology background. It was more that I saw the, the, the sort of like the dark lining of crime around architecture. And I wanted to explore that in more detail. Thanks. I have a quick question. Uh, as an architect and, and somebody who's done lots of research in this area, uh, can you talk a little bit to the maybe thought that, that architects and, and builders in general give to uh, criminology when designing buildings? Is this something that people tend to take into account or are we mostly looking at, you know, how do people move around the building? How can we make it efficient and pretty and this sort of thing? Yeah, I mean that's a that's a really interesting question. Um, I do think it depends on the architects and the architectural firms and and the and what they've been hired to design. Um, but I, my my answer would be that in general, um, I have found that there are at least two reasons why architects tend not to think about security. Um, one is that I think that there is a a misconception that to think about security inherently means that you're sort of designing. Um, a sort of a paranoiac or even quote unquote right wing space um, that you know you're you're creating a fortress uh, you're you're separating people from the public um, you know you're denying the 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 public benefit at the at the um, to 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 give uh, the private sphere more more uh, yeah freedom or or security et cetera you know security in and of itself is seen as a dangerous um, political narrative for some architects to get into um, and then other and then the other one is uh, aesthetic that our, our architects I think wrongly think that a secure building is an ugly building or it's a building that looks like a a bank vault or it looks like a police station or it looks like a prison. Um, and so I have found that in general, most architects, uh, and, th and then ironically, this makes the problem much worse, um, is that architects uh, don't think about security and they just allow the aftermarket uh, to take care of that. And so, you know, you buy a house and it may be the most badly designed house from a security point of view imaginable, but the assumption is that you're then going to go get a security camera installed. Um, you might put up burglar bars on certain windows. Um, you know, you're going to get the right high security lock. Uh, or you might replace a door with, you know, um, uh, you know, a, a stronger glass or that kind of thing. 
Um, but so ironically, the aftermarket approach to this is, I think, responsible for why so many neighborhoods, especially here in Los Angeles, um, really can look like, uh, you know, a sort of dystopian world of, of yeah, burglar bars and razor wire, chain link fences and that kind of thing. Um, I think if architects were to take the most basic uh, ideas of security uh, and, and, and run with them aesthetically, I think they could come up with much more um, interesting and visually and even culturally sensitive and exciting solutions to the problem of crime. And you wouldn't even notice it because it would be uh, it would be an architecturally designed uh, solution to this. Um, and so I would actually suggest that you know people architects do take this uh, seriously and not just leave it up to private security firms, um, who I think ironically are the reason why a lot of these uh, uh, solutions appear so dystopian and um, appear so sort of uh, heavy-handed. So I, th I think that that's something that I would I would um, I would urge. Awesome, thank you, uh, Steve. I was just super fascinated with the parallels uh, between architectural design and like the broken window theory, um, which in short is in New York during some of the crime waves, they made policies that like every car is being, every car on the rail system is being cleaned before it goes back out again. So there's never graffiti. There's no broken windows that are allowed. They made, made this big policy to fix all the broken windows. They fixed a bunch of street lights and like that kind of thing ended up being a apparently a driver to uh, reduce crime rates for actually external like violent crime on the street things like that as well um and i just kind of find it fascinating that i think that this architectural thing can happen on both like the individual building scale and through this like environment of what the city you're in is i mean i know as a as a child my my thing was climbing and climbing on buildings everywhere and we just climbed all the buildings in our our city and it was it was like a challenge and it was a, you know, that kind of thing. And then we realized all of a sudden it was like, oh no, but like we're gonna be accused of burglary because of this rather than it's just like a fun thing to do that's a little bit of, you know, teenage angst. Um, and I'm curious like like what it is that you would, would find most important to build, to like take that kind of like teen experience or like like the, as you were talking about the people that have had like the access to the insider uh, inside of buildings, how do you take that and make a protocol that like kind of pulls um, pulls that experience into doing good things as opposed to turning, pulling that experience into committing crimes? Yeah. Well, yeah, I mean, that is a, an extremely, uh, uh, I mean, it's a, it's a good, it's a good question that I don't think has a, a, an immediately clear answer. I mean, I think that the, the notion of exploration and the notion of having access to spaces around the city, you know, whether it's an alleyway or it's the rooftop of a skyscraper, um, or for that matter, it's an abandoned uh, subway station, uh, you know, beneath the beneath the streets. Um, you know, it, it often is public infrastructure, and so theoretically, we as the public should have access to it. Um, but of course, then there's questions of terrorism, there's questions of vandalism, there's there's uh, there's there are questions that get folded into that. Uh, uh, you know, and access becomes um, a kind of a second order concern, uh, at least from the people that run the city. Um, but yeah, how does one maintain that? I mean, I that, I I don't know. You know, I mean, I think that uh, in everyone's daily life, I think uh, exploring buildings, I think is something that uh, can and should be done. I mean, even even something as stupid as, uh, you know, when you're staying in a hotel or you're in an office building, try to find try to find the stairs and take them. Um, get off at a different floor, uh, just sort of see what the building is like. I mean, little things like that, I think, are a good way to um, physically remember that buildings are spaces and you can you can move through them, you can explore them. Um, you know, uh, you could take that to an extreme and, and build like, uh, some kind of burglary park, uh, you know, and allow people to go in and cut their way through walls and that kind of thing. Uh, I think there'd be way too many liability concerns, uh, but it would be cool. Uh, you know, I, I don't know if uh, I'll let somebody else solve the insurance problem. Um, but you know, how how do you how do you how does one uh, uh, design for that? Um, just then, then to go back to the the idea of broken windows theory, though. I mean, I think that I mean, first of all, there's there's a lot of question about whether or not it's a viable theory, um, you know, and whether or not it's an effective way to gauge um, the criminality of a given neighborhood or the likelihood of crime occurring on a particular street uh, tends to be mostly a question of aesthetics. Again, it's about blight. It's about um, things looking good, things looking clean. Um, but on the other hand, uh, just briefly, um, there is actually, especially in England, um, uh, my wife is British. And so um, I'm, I've, I'm in England a lot. And um, part of my book was reported with uh, British police officers. 
Um, and they actually have an entire design program over there where they will, the, the police uh, will get in touch with architects, especially architects designing council housing and that kind of thing, um, public housing, and they will offer design guidelines. Um, and so on one level, I think this is actually totally fascinating. Like, why would you not want that sort of insight? Um, you know, if a, if, a, if, a, if a law enforcement officer can point out that, the, you know, having this kind of window on the side of your house or uh, this place for someone to hide behind trees that isn't visible from a neighbor, um, you know, that's actually information that I think is quite interesting to know. Like, that's a blind spot in our neighborhood. Somebody could be hiding there, you know, when I go out to walk the dog at night, and now I know that it's good. Um, but on the other hand, of course, that, you know, the there's something I think that sounds so Orwellian to everyone where, you know, the cops help design this this neighborhood. Um, you know, you get into a really interesting ideological slash political argument about whether or not that's a good or bad thing, um, you know, it, at, at, at any scale. Um, and so, you know, I feel like there's it's almost like. Um, I mean, to a certain extent, I think it's a it's a it's a political it's a it's what side of the political spectrum you're on about whether or not you would think that's a good idea. Um, but so police actively engaging in the design process is already a real thing. Um, and it's kind of a litmus test about how how one feels about that. But um, I'll, just, I'll just mention that as, an, as a, a part of the broken windows um, discussion. Thank you. Uh, Chanel? Um, you described your book as being, um, in some ways, the opposite of seeing like a state. And I'd be interested in hearing more um, elaboration about that. Um, like, is it, I guess, that the criminals have sort of localized bottom up knowledge sort of in resistance to standards? Or, I mean, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts. Sure. Um, I don't know that I would describe it as the opposite of, uh, of seeing like a state, but I would say that it is a, it does have that kind of inversion, you know, where it's, um, you know, seeing like a burglar is, uh, I mean, to a certain extent, it's almost just like taking the contrast on a, on a black and white photograph and just reversing it. Um, so you're looking at the same thing, you know, you're looking at a public housing complex, or you're looking at a big box store, um, you know, or you're looking at a bank downtown, um, but you're just seeing it through a, the op the opposite eyes. So, um, you know, or or the fire code idea, you know, where the state sees fire code as a way of carefully regulating and sculpting architectural space for the benefit of the public, uh, or, or rather, you know what I mean, the, of, uh, the, 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 the citizenry uh, to keep us safe from fires. A burglar looks at that exact same code and can choose which apartment to rob, um, and so it's just sort of the. It's yeah. So I, I guess I would say it's it's less that it's the opposite of seeing like a state, and simply that it's uh it's like putting on different colored glasses and seeing the same thing from a different point of view, um, and I think that that's sort of like the George Leonidas Leslie example that I gave, where you know it's an architect who knows how to build bank vaults, but that's exactly why he was really good at robbing bank vaults, um, and so that kind of idea. It's like the insider threat. Um, it's the person who knows the system and can turn that system against it. Um, it's that kind of role that I think is quite interesting. And um, especially in this case with architecture, I think it's, uh, you know, the, the fact that that turns into a whole class of criminal activity. Um, yeah, it's kind of like that inverted seeing like a state, seeing like a burglar. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, Drew? Hey, Jeff. Um, I love the talk. Uh, one of the most interesting things that you talked about was this repetition of like the, Mac the McDonald's floor plans and stuff and how that created these like scalable vulnerabilities. And my question about that is, have you encountered any solutions to those types of security issues that actually involve like making the information once again, like less legible or like randomizing designs or or making things more difficult to predict, not by like hardening that physical walls of the building, but actually making the information less accessible to reduce the scalability of the crime, or maybe you've come up with some ideas just based um, yeah. on your research. Uh, no, actually, um, I mean, on one level, uh, it would be as, as simple as figuring out where someone like Roofman would tunnel down into a, a McDonald's and then just fortifying that spot mm -hmm. so that, you know, any sort of weakness that's immediately above the cash register or wherever it might be, you know, down back in the food storage area, just fortify that and make sure that those types of crimes are, are not possible. Um, but I think a more interesting example was uh, actually, um, uh, I want to say it was my wife's great aunt, I think it was, uh, but uh, nevertheless was an archaeologist in England um, and was in uh, uh, tasked with drawing floor plans of uh, stately homes in England. You know, so when you go to visit, you know, a mansion on on beautiful grounds, 
and you pick up a flyer before you go in and it shows photographs of, of period furniture and it has a floor plan. Um, the floor plans were wrong uh, and it was deliberate. So they, they didn't want you to be able to go home with an accurate floor plan so that you could plan on robbing the, uh, the stately home. And so there would be errors in the floor plan uh, just so that you wouldn't know what you were getting into. Um, you know, there's a great example. Um, uh, I'm sure you all have heard of trap streets. Um, but if not, a trap street is a is a cartographic error that is deliberately introduced into a mapping company's uh, products so that if they look at a rival company and that rival company has that same street on their map, um, it's since it is a fake street, that by definition shows that they've copied uh, illegally uh, your copyrighted cartographic materials. And so it's a trap street. You've trapped them. Um, but so I think it's kind of interesting that you could have a trap room uh, you know, in in the sense that you know it's a it's a fake room that is there to sort of mislead burglars, um, or you know you don't. I mean, what an example was that like she'd never was she was told not to put certain staircases on the floor plan so that you wouldn't know exactly how to get to the second floor. You know where 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 more of the private residence kind of stuff might be, or more of the more valuable materials might be might be kept. Um, but so that would be an example of hiding information in plain sight. Um, also, you know, taking uh, floor plan uh, info off the internet, uh, you know, is is something that can can happen. Um, you also see this in Google Street View. Um, you can request that Google blur out your house um, so that your home is not on Google Street View. Uh, and most of the time that's for quote unquote privacy, but often that's really just a code name for security. Um, and so the idea is that nobody can scan the outside of your house on Google Street View and figure out you know, where the windows are or where the shrubbery is that you can hide behind. Um, so yeah, hiding information, making sure it's not legible or available. Um, those are all definitely things that that um, I've, I've seen examples of. Thank you, Jeff. Uh, any other questions? I know Anand had his hand raised or their hand raised. Go ahead. Hi. Um, thanks for the talk. It was super interesting. Um, I wanted to ask um, the inversion of burglary, which we've mostly talked about to me is the prison break, which I know you've also researched. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to ask for a related example or more thoughts on how those things are related. Oh, uh, sure. Yeah, no, that's actually, it's a great question. Um, yeah, so uh, I do actually think that, I mean, a heist is basically a, a prison break in reverse. Um, um, and often it's the same types of things. Um, I'm, of course, I'm not saying this as a, as a, as an expert in, in a, Prison escape, um, having never done it myself, um, but nevertheless, uh, you know, you you often do see examples both from fiction and from real life where someone has escaped from a jail or a prison um, in the same kinds of ways. They'll notice routines. They'll notice uh, there's times of day where guards do certain things. Um, there are spaces where certain events occur, um, and if you m understand those patterns and if you understand um, how and when they occur and even where they occur. Um, you can you can begin to piece together a a, a system a way of exit, um, and similar to Nakatomi space, um, you know it's kind of almost like uh, it's just a it's just a, re a reverse application of Nakatomi space. It's how to get out as opposed to how to get in, um, and so you know you might follow um, the wastewater pipes because the pipes have to go somewhere. They're going to leave the building by definition. Um, so if you follow the pipes, you yourself might be able to exit. Um, laundry is a really popular uh, example, or you know a, a common example, I should say. Um, in fact, if I remember correctly, um, Roofman, um, before he held up in the Toys R Us, um, you know, he escaped from jail and he did so, if I remember correctly, um, riding a, in a laundry truck. Um, and so, you know, used that, used the system of how the, how the prison was maintained um, to uh, actually get out of the prison. Um, but so you see those kinds of examples. And um, yeah, I think it's a, a uh, I, I put together a film festival prior to writing A Burglar's Guide to the City. Uh, it was called Breaking Out and Breaking In. And so it was 10 films of prison breaks and then 10 films of heists. Um, and there are so many architectural uh, uh, similarities. It's, it's, it's quite fascinating. But, um, but yeah, that's, that's, that, that's definitely something that I, I have highlighted and I would agree. And I think it's a, it's a, good, it's a good observation slash question. Thanks, Jeff. Um, we do have one more question. Are you willing to stick around for a few more minutes to yeah, uh, to finish this out here? Great, uh, David. Fast. What's the best heist film and why? Oh. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, I mean, the the one that I, I certainly got the most mileage out of in terms of just thinking about and writing about, I would say, was Die Hard. Um, there's a there's another one that I think is quite good. It's called um, 
and, and let me just qualify that use of good or best. Um, often the thing that's most interesting is not necessarily good. Um, it's just the most interesting. Um, so there are movies that I, you know, am a huge fan of that I think are are uh, wildly interesting, um, but by no means would I ever say it's a good movie. Um, but so in any case, uh, there's another movie called uh, uh, The Day They Robbed the Bank of England. And um, again, it's not a particularly good film, but it's a, it's an old black and white kind of classic bank robbery film. And um, it's really, really good or nice in terms of how it layers. It's clever in terms of how it layers everything from a, an awareness of the tides along the Thames in London uh, to where the sewers go, uh, to how the vault of the Bank of England is designed. Um, and this individual, uh, you know, is able to access the, the, the or to, to break into the Bank of England. Um, you know, using all the things that we've been talking about, the timing of the of the tides, uh, the location of the sewers, et cetera. Um, uh, the Italian job is fun, you know, both both of them, I think, uh, you know, whether or not I'd say it's the best movie is would be a whole other thing. But, um, you know, it is it is a, it's maybe a little self-consciously clever. Um, and then also uh, I got a, I have a soft spot in my in my in my heart for the bank job. Uh, it's a Jason Statham movie from I want to say like 2006. Uh, it's also set in London, and um, it's also just fun in the sense that it's a very, very architectural premise. You know, they're trying to get from one storefront to another one that's down the street, um, and they have to get to it by tunneling underneath the the building in the middle. Uh, and then at one point, they inadvertently fall into an old uh, 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 sort of burial catacomb um, from the plague days of of older London. Um, and it's just a nice kind of way of exploring the the layering of the city. Um, you know, there are movies like uh, Heat that, that are certainly, I think, are are, are good, uh, but at the same time, like the heist itself is actually not particularly compelling to me. Um, it's just a good movie. So, um, but yeah, if I, when I was on my uh, deathbed and I had only one movie to watch, I mean, that would be tough to choose. But I think that the, those kinds of, the movies that I just mentioned are, are one. There's another one, actually, let me say briefly. Um, it's called Street Thief. Um, it was kind of a fake documentary. It came out maybe around 2009, 2010. Uh, r roughly, maybe 2008, um, and uh, it it follows a fake, it follows a burglar, a, a fictional burglar around as if it's a documentary, and um, it's another example of, um, you know, it shows you the method, how this guy gets into places, you know, he has, uh, he wears a hard hat with a union patch so that he can walk around, uh, you know, uh, just, he just goes through the employee only door, and nobody bats an eye, because he's got a high-vis vest and a, and a hard hat on, you can get, you can basically get into anywhere dressed like that. Um, and uh, including how he chooses what to what to break into and what night of the week to break into based on the receipts that he has stolen. So that's another example of just sort of it shows the sort of tactical thinking that would would lend itself to, to targeting. Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks for your time here with us. Um, really appreciate you take. Yeah. Taking the time to chat with us about your um, about your book and about your experience and. Uh, yeah, um, so there is a, a, a channel in our Discord server um, that is for these guest talks, and each guest talk has its own forum post. Uh, so if you'd like to continue the conversation there, um, we can do so. I will be uploading this recording to YouTube, our YouTube channel, as well as uh, exporting this chat thread, which is quite extensive. So. Um, those things will all be available, and if you'd like to continue the conversation, the uh, thread in the Discord channel would be the place to do it. Um, once again, thanks, thanks to Jeff, and we will see you all on Friday for a discussion about the pilot study, uh, the paper that started.